On the Spot with Michelle McCrory is brought to you by MELD, the next generation decentralized global bank. Welcome back to the second part of our conversation with George Gammon. George is a renowned investor, macroeconomics expert, entrepreneur, and host of the Rebel Capitalist Show. So George, in part one, we were discussing CBDC, central bank digital currencies, and how much easier it is to implement a huge change to the system in times of crisis. And we were discussing how an inverted yield curve could signal that we're headed for a crisis. Now, an inverted yield curve is an unusual state in which longer term bonds have a lower yield than short term bonds or debt instruments. And it has been a reliable indicator that we're headed for a recession. And you pointed out that it is a warning signal to look out for and that based on trades and positions taken by big players in the past, it seems that there could be a group of some insider intelligence about the bigger picture, a global intel syndicate, as you called it. And in one of your previous videos, you mentioned positions taken by Paul Tudor Jones just ahead of COVID. So explain that and why it may raise eyebrows. Break that down for us. Sure, absolutely. If you go back to the 1950s, you see that the inversion of the yield curve has incredible accuracy as far as its predictive power. So it's almost batting a thousand. There was one time in the mid 1960s where we had an inverted curve and we did not have a recession, but nominal GDP came down quite significantly. And so, and we have never had a recession without an inversion of the curve. So if you look at any other economic indicator, there's none that are close to as accurate as the inversion of the curve. So you have to say, why? Why is that? And for me, I think it's because these financial insiders that control billions, if not trillions of dollars, have insider information. And it's not illegal insider information, but they have access to details that you know, we don't have, CNBC doesn't have, and even a lot of these pension fund managers, maybe even a lot of the banksters like Jamie Dimon, that they don't even have. So the example I used in the video specifically was the uh, it was COVID. And I've mentioned a report that came out from the GOP that stated that if we had, if this was a, a lab leak type of scenario, that most likely occurred in August of 2019. And then what happened is you had the Chinese military games. That was the first, you know, quote unquote, super spreader event. Their words, not mine. And so that's when it kind of really started traveling to other countries and it became the problem that, uh, that we know it was. So if you look at the curve back then, it did invert in 2019 and it had its maximum inversion. Now I'm talking about the three month and the 10 year in what month? Well, that would be August of 2019. And so I always thought that the curve inverted because the repo market blew up. But actually, if you think about it, the repo market blew up in September. Right off the top of my head, I believe it was September 17th. So this was two or three weeks after we had that maximum inversion in the curve. So if you think about this, to me, it makes a lot of sense. So let's just imagine what happened, assuming that this was a, a lab leak. So you've got the scientist there in Wuhan that knows, oh, shoot, this is a big problem. This just leaked out. I need to notify someone ASAP because this could be a global pandemic. So he calls the local politician and he's you know screaming and yelling, saying he's trying to uh, really uh, he's trying to communicate the urgency here. Right. So then that local politician gets up on the phone to another politician. This goes up the chain of command until it probably gets up to Xi Jinping. But along the lines, you think that one of those politicians isn't calling their banker. Of course they are. They're going to call their banker. And then that banker is going to call Jamie Dimon. And then Jamie Dimon is going to call Paul Tudor Jones or George Soros or Warren Buffett or Larry Fink, you know, it's fill in the blank. And so then what's Paul Tudor Jones going to do? He's going to say, OK, if you I believe you, I trust you. If this is a big deal, we need to know about it. If this is something that's going to be far worse than MERS or SARS or, or Zika or something like that, I've got to position my portfolio accordingly. So he sends one of his trusted assistants out to Wuhan to actually talk to that scientist. And if you don't think that Paul Tudor Jones could pull that off, I don't think you understand the power that the financial insiders have, right? 
So then you can imagine that assistant going out there and talking to the actual scientist that understands how big of a problem this could be. And then he gets on the phone with Paul Tudor Jones and he downloads all of this information. Then what is Paul Tudor Jones going to do? He's going to go out. He's going to buy the long end of the curve. He's going to buy 10-year treasuries. He's going to buy 30-year treasuries. And this is going to create more demand. Therefore, price goes up, yield goes down. And then you combine this with the Federal Reserve raising rates at the front end of the curve, and that's why it inverts. In my video, uh, that I, the specific example I use so people can get their head around this, is just let's remember the movie Back to the Future. Remember in that movie, old Biff found that, that almanac, and he went back in time and gave it to his young self so the young Biff would know the outcome of all these sporting events to where he could uh, predict, you know, with 100% accuracy, who's going to win and who's going to lose. That, that's what's going on right now with these financial insiders. And in my opinion, that's why the curve inverts. And that's why it is so darn accurate going all the way back to the 1950s, because those financial insiders, they have Biff's almanac. They know what's coming up, you know, in the next year or so. They've, uh, whether it's, you know, let's look at the curve being inverted right now. Is this because China's going to blow up? Is this because we're going to have uh, World War III? Is this because the commercial real estate market is going to blow up the balance sheet of all these regional banks that will have this systemic risk with the euro dollar system? We don't know. But I can almost assure you that the Warren Buffett types do. And as a result, they buy that long into the curve. And again, I think that's why it's so accurate. So I want to point out, though, that the, the, the stuff doesn't hit the fan, if you will, until the curve is no longer inverted. And so right now it's inversion. We've got three possible outcomes. Either it's going to stay inverted forever, which is almost a zero probability, or it's going to uninvert or steepen out by the long end going up or the short end going down. Right. And so if the long end goes up, well, that's because we've got a soft landing. That means that Jerome Powell's done everything right. And therefore, the economy is booming. And then the curve would steepen out like it normally would. But that would require the 10 year going up, to, let's say, six, seven, eight percent. Or you've got the other scenario where it steepens out because the Fed drops the front end of the curve by lowering interest rates. Well, this is only going to happen in a crisis type situation. So then the question becomes, if you go back to 1950, how many times has the curve, quote unquote, uninverted as a result of the long end going up or what they would call a bear steepener? That would be zero times, zero times. So there's almost, you know, uh, well, there are no certainties there are only probabilities, but it's you've got a very high probable outcome that the way we uninvert this time is a result of the Fed dropping rates. OK, so that bull steepener. So what does that mean? Well, put yourself in the position of Jerome Powell right now. He wants to be remembered as Paul Volcker. His greatest nightmare right now is being remembered as Arthur, Arthur Burns. Burns. Yeah. Right. So he has a huge incentive to keep rates even higher than they otherwise would need to be, even based on the analysis that he's getting from those 900 PhDs at the Fed. Right. Because he's thinking about legacy. So you have to ask yourself, what type of economic environment would we have to have in order for Jerome Powell, that, by the way, just came out last week at Jackson Hole and was talking extremely hawkish. What would what would prompt him to drop rates from, let's say, 5.5 percent straight back down to four, three, two, maybe even back down to zero like we saw during covid? Well, that would require some sort of black swan that would create some sort or that would require some sort of, like I said, unfortunately, world war or a GFC 2.0. And I think that's what that yield curve is predicting right now. But mm -hmm. to be clear, you don't get that recession. You don't get that stuff hitting the fan until after the curve is no longer inverted. So what I would suggest all of your viewers do is it's very simple. Just watch the two year and the 10 year. Right now, the two year is trading, the yield is trading above the 10 year. Just watch for that to slowly go down, assuming that's what happens. And when it gets down to that 10 year level and then goes down below to where the curve now is steep again, that's when you really have to be risk off. And that's when you really have to be paying attention. Right. And George, just to clarify, in that scenario where you outlined what potentially happened with Paul Tudor Jones, that is you speculating, but the trades reflect uh, that there was some kind of knowledge, potentially the trades in terms of the positions that he took with regards to treasuries and what we saw with the inverted yield curve, that would reflect a narrative consistent 
what you are saying may or may most likely may have happened. Just to, to be clear for our viewers there, you didn't call up yeah. some scientists in the Wuhan lab and uh, got an account that this conversation no, so went that, on. That, that was a fictional story. <laughs> yes. that, I want to be very, but, very clear. And I'm but, just using Paul Tudor Jones just as an example. I don't know if it was him. It, it could have been someone else. I'm just using that as right. a fictional hypothetical story to explain kind of why I think the yield curve has such a uh, is so accurate as far as its ability to predict a recession. And I would give you a specific example, and I use this in the video, of a politician. I can't remember the guy's name, but this was back in February of 2020. So this was as the market was still going up, still going up and up and up and up. And people thought this COVID thing was going to be a nothing burger, right? He was He was in charge of some sort of intelligence committee for the government. And it was a Republican guy, but the Democrats did it as well. And so what they did is they they tracked his trades because this is when there was that big uh, brouhaha about the insider tradings with Nancy Pelosi and all these other politicians, you know, maybe a year ago or something. So they went back and looked at his trades from uh, February, maybe in January, I can't recall, of 2020. And sure enough, what did he do? He basically sold all of his stocks and he bought the 10 year treasury. He bought the 10 year treasury because he, he, he was smart enough to know that in times of crisis, that's what you want to own because you're going to get paid. It's good. You have very little counterparty risk and you're going to have some serious capital appreciation, assuming that the Fed drops rates. Right. And you're referring to Senator Richard Burr. And you detailed in that video how he happened to be the chair of the Intelligence Committee at the time, and he was getting briefed on the coronavirus pandemic. And in February of 2020, Burr sold $1.6 million worth of stock, including tens of thousands of dollars in stock in the hospitality industry, which, as we know, was particularly hard hit in the coronavirus pandemic. But very importantly, he also bought $1.2 million of treasury securities, which you highlight in the video. So using that back to the future sports almanac metaphor, seems that he did have one of those on hand. So now, George, the curve is inverted, and you were telling me earlier that we should be watching China very closely here. Yeah, so if I had to give you my uh, highest conviction on why the curve is inverted, it would definitely be China. Definitely be China. You know, we talked about several different potentials, but that I think has the highest probability of uh, actually coming to fruition. So, it, and it would be consistent too, because remember the whole mainstream narrative is that China reopening is going to be this big boom in the economy and that they're going to, you know, put the whole world economy on their shoulders and we're just going to ride off into this new wave of economic growth. But when they actually reopened, what happened? You just got the China falling off an economic cliff and it's not just the real estate there, it's the manufacturing sector. Right? I mean, they... I did a video yesterday, and I don't know if your viewers realize this, but there in, in most of their large cities, housing prices went down by 9% in July. One month, Michelle. Yeah. That, that's not a year over year number. That's a month over month number. 9% down. So, th and this is an economy where 30% of GDP is real estate, 70% of Chinese wealth is in real estate. And then you have all of these entities like Country Garden, like Evergrande, that have borrowed billions and billions. And I think if you take the whole economy uh, uh, in its entirety, it would have trillions of dollars of denominated debt that, were, uh, that they borrowed from banks outside of China. So why is that important? Because these banks are in the Euro dollar system. And the Euro dollar system is the, the network of banks outside of the United States offshore that create most of the dollar liquidity for the global economy. So if these banks are taking a hit, just like Silicon Valley, First Republic, uh, Credit Suisse, et cetera, then they're gonna restrict their lending. They're gonna tighten credit, right? So if, tighten, if they're tightening credit, that, that means less dollar liquidity. If that's less dollar liquidity, then you have a shortage of dollar cash flow to pay back this debt. And if that happens, 
then you have a shortage of dollars circulating in the global economy, which basically is what created the GFC 1.0 that we saw in 2008. So everyone thinks that was all about mortgages or subprime and all this stuff. And that it, it's true. That was a big problem. And that was a catalyst. But if those mortgage-backed securities, as an example, weren't used as collateral in the global monetary system, we would have had a real estate crash and that's it. That's it. We would not have had a global financial crisis. The problem is that created this, this uh, massive increase in perceived counterparty risk with the banking system. So they were, they were not willing to lend. And if they're not willing to lend, the global economy freezes up. And that's exactly what we saw. So my point here is that the GFC 1, the catalyst was centered in the United States. But I think mm -hmm. the GFC 2 that we could be going into in 2024 is going to be sent or could be centered around the Chinese economy collapsing, their real estate market collapsing, and therefore tightening up the credit issuance and dollar liquidity from this global banking system and uh that's maybe what the yield curve is predicting right now. Right. And to your point, we have seen signs of weakness in China's economy, slowing GDP, as you mentioned. China's exports saw the biggest drop in three years last month because of weaker global demand. And according to official data, which we always take with a big grain of salt, considering the source, exports were down 14.5% in July compared to a year ago. Imports also down over 12%. And China is also dealing with deflation for the first time in two years. Consumer prices falling 0.3% in July. China also has that property crisis that it has to contend with. As you mentioned, we saw China Evergrande Group file for bankruptcy protection. And Evergrande is China's second largest property developer by sales. So certainly signs of shakiness with regards to China's economy. We've got that inverted yield curve in the U.S. as we discussed. So what is a way to position oneself financially? This is not financial advice, but how are you positioned for this? You got to do it. The guys are doing that have Biff's Almanac. <laughs> we don't have the Almanac. We've got you, no, though. But, 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 but my point wait, is... Wait, we got to buy some treasuries. Uh, so I can't... Uh, to your point, I can't give anyone... Uh, personal financial advice, but I can tell you what I'm doing with my own portfolio. And I'm saying, okay, that curve is inverted for a reason. And it's because the insiders have Biff's Almanac, most likely. And so I want to place whatever bet they're betting. And right now, that, that's good because it's contrarian, right? Because everyone's back over on the side of, oh, soft landing, no landing, all these uh, you know things that you hear in the mainstream media. So if you take the position of, okay, no, this is going to be a hard landing, and this is being confirmed with what the yield curve is telling me because there's a hundred basis point delta between the 10 year and Fed funds for heaven's sakes, then I would want to place that same bet. Now, I don't like the long end of the curve because to me, you know, if you have to sell for the liquidity, let's just say the trade goes against you, then you're taking a haircut. And I, I don't like I don't like that risk. Right. So what I'm doing in my own personal portfolio, I always have 10 percent gold. Always. And that's just it's recession, economic boom, inverted key curve, steep and curve. It doesn't matter. Always, I have that 10% gold for uh, insurance. And it goes back to having purchasing power outside the system as well. And then I like to have 80% of my portfolio in an investment, which I consider things that pay me to own them. And then 10% in this speculative class, which I think there's good asymmetry. Uh, that might be a Bitcoin, that might be silver, uranium, some, or gold miners would be actually a good example of that. So right now, I'm looking down the road 10 years. And I personally think that we are in the midst of a long-term commodity super cycle. So I, I don't now I'm not saying I'm out there buying right now, because if you do have this big recession, hard landing that the yield curve is predicting, well, commodity prices are going to absolutely tank. But what I want to do is I want to use that as an opportunity. You know, the bigger the crisis, the bigger the opportunity. But mm -hmm. you have to have the liquidity to go ahead and take action. So I'm keeping as much liquidity as I possibly can, dry powder, if you will, just in short term treasury, just in short term T-bills, one month three month, and then just rolling it over. So you're getting paid 5.5% while you wait to see how this plays out. And then you have really no risk of uh, principal loss because you can just wait till that maturity or to that uh, T-bill matures and then you get paid 100% 
plus your interest. And then you can go out and deploy that cash if you find something you like that turns out to be cheap as a result of a global recession, if not something worse. Right. Uh, just to clarify, when you say 10% gold, George, is that 10% in physical gold? I like physical gold. I mean, that, that's what I prefer. But if I can't, like if I'm traveling, if, I, if I'm in an area where I can't just, uh, where it's not realistic, let's say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't want to give too much information on the internet. <laughs> but then I, I like uh, the Sprott Trust. Okay. Uh, I think that's great. I don't know if you guys have a, a similar type of product, but uh, I like that. And uh, for the uranium, I like the Sprott Trust as well. Okay. Well, 10% gold, uh, and we won't ask you where you do keep your physical gold coins. So I have asked. <laughs> <laughs> I keep it under your chair, Michelle, right there in your studio. <laughs> uh, that's right by where I keep mine. So there we go. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for keeping us informed. That much you've certainly done. George, really appreciate your analysis across a range of topics. So thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to have you back again soon. Oh, thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. All right, George Gavin, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And as always, thank you for watching. I'm Michelle McCory for me and the rest of the team at Kitco. See you next time. On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Meld, the next generation multi-chain crypto wallet that allows you to unlock the value of your crypto without liquidating your position. Undertake easy cross-chain transfers, yield and borrowing by handling your crypto and fiat processes with transparency. Transfer fiat to and from crypto exchanges at low cost and in 15 currencies. Meld, your one account for money and crypto at your fingertips.